Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for what can learn what can jurors learn from Tank Man hosted by the Fully Informed Jury Association. I'm Kirsten Tynan, Executive Director of the Fully Informed Jury Association. And today I'm joined by our guest, Robert Anthony Peters, Vice Chairman of the Fully Informed Jury Association and a professional actor and director. Thank you for joining us, Robert. I'm always glad to see you. Thank you, likewise. Robert is the writer and director of the short film that we are about to see as soon as I get through a little introduction here. Uh, his screen work is too long to list, but I will mention that it has included roles in the movies The Pursuit of Happiness with Will Smith and Steve Jobs with Michael Fassbender, among many others. And I couldn't even begin to list all of his stage roles, but I will note my particular fondness for his performance as Septimus in the Tom Stoppard play Arcadia. In addition to being a professional actor and SAG-AFTRA member, as well as an award-winning filmmaker, Robert is also a frequent lecturer on a variety of pro-liberty topics. In a moment, I'm going to turn this over to Robert to introduce his short film that will be screening first. Because I have rural Montana speed internet, as a note pops up on my screen saying my con connection is unstable, Robert has kindly agreed to play the film from his metropolitan area speed internet. <laughs> You, you might have built up my internet too much. It's stalled <laughs> out a couple of times. Also. I don't we're know gonna, if that's me or you or what. But. We're going to be okay. <laughs> um, I will leave the introductory remarks about the content of the film to Robert, but because I personally know him to be a somewhat self-effacingly modest person, I will point out that his film has won over a dozen awards though I don't know how many because he doesn't have them all on the film's website. But they include the award for best short film at the 2019 Whistleblower Summit and Film Festival and the Audience Choice Award at the 2019 Anthem Film Festival. And Robert, if you would please introduce the film and get us going and then we'll come back after the film and have a good conversation. Take it away. Thanks, Kirsten. Thanks for organizing this. You've always been a huge supporter, uh, uh, well, of me and the film, and I really appreciate it. Um, so this is the story about a man who most of us are familiar with, if only in just a very brief and impersonal way. Most of us have seen the picture, I've got uh, the image uh, of the famous photograph on, on my t-shirt here. We, we've seen this is one of the uh, 20th century's most vaunted images. And um, I uh, had, a, had an idea to do a film about him to kind of give a brief backstory of his life what led up to that moment in time. Uh, it's pure conjecture. We'll be, we do not have a positive identification on the man, and that's probably a good thing for his sake. Uh, and uh, this was made through the good graces of Taliesin and my friend Patrick Reason over there, who uh, he and his organization provided a tremendous amount of support to make this film happen. And uh, I think without further ado, let's uh, screen the film and, and then hopefully field any questions you might have afterwards. There was a mountain top where they weld a thousand ants. One day, the top of the mountain caught on fire, and the ants had to get to the bottom of the mountain as quickly as possible to stay safe. So the ants huddled together to form a ball, and they rolled from the top of the mountain to the bottom. Those ants who volunteered to be on the outside were hurt, but the inside ones survived.
small counter-revolutionary riot was quelled in the capital yesterday. Rioters savagely attacked soldiers of the People's Liberation Army. But all is peaceful once again. Citizens of the capital must obey martial law and cooperate with the People's Liberation Army to protect the Constitution and safeguard the security of our great motherland. We cannot guarantee the safety of violators who will be solely responsible for any consequences. <laughs> Obedient citizens will remain safe and happy. As soon as I finish the report, I come right back. Oh, I stop by Zhihua's. I get some food too. We don't know how long this will last. Please ask if Wei has come back. She hasn't heard from him in two days. He loves it when he babysits. I hope he's safe. Pink, come here. Daddy will be back soon. I don't want to go out there. It's too dangerous. I only went to stock up on food from Jihua, but she's not even in the store. We can share ours. One thing is inside. My wife keeps telling me we should do something, but what can we do? Nobody should be out at the square. They're just causing trouble. Some are, but surely not all. There's nothing we can do.
Jin Yang, what are you doing here? Finishing up the inventory sheets. Ah, no one inspected the work today. I just stopped by to check the locks, make sure no one broke in. I was afraid you might be out there, actually. I wonder if one day people will look back at this as the beginning of a new era. I'm getting together with some neighbors today to see if there's anything we can do to help the students. Most are hiding or on the run. You should join us. I need to get home. <sighs> Small fire is soon quenched. I wish my generation had done something about all of these. I hope your generation will, so it doesn't become an inheritance for your children. got caught up in what his friends are doing. He's just trying to do what he thinks is right. Who knows what that is anymore? All these young people killed. I wish you were here. Say it with me.
There was a mountain top where they wailed a thousand ants. One day, the top of the mountain caught on fire. Those ants who volunteered to be on the outside were hurt, but the inside ones survived. event happened in the Chinese capital, Beijing. Thousands of people, most of them innocent civilians, were killed by fully armed soldiers when they forced their way into the city. Among the killed are our colleagues at Radio Beijing. The soldiers were riding on armored vehicles and used machine guns against thousands of local residents and students who tried to block their way. When the army convoys made a breakthrough, soldiers continued to spray their bullets indiscriminately at crowds in the street. Eyewitnesses say some armored vehicles even crushed foot soldiers who hesitated in front of the resisting civilians. Radio Beijing English Department deeply mourns those died in a tragic incident and appeals to all its listeners to join our protest for the gross violation of human rights and the most barbarous suppression of the people. Because of the abnormal situation here in Beijing, there is no other news we could bring you. We sincerely ask for your understanding, and thank you for joining us at this most tragic moment. It's sure hard to just pick up after that. You just kind of want to sit there and be by yourself. At least I do. But uh, whew, wow, what in to think that how many times I've seen this and how long ago you released it and it's still I still get chills in the same spots and I still tear up. So I shouldn't have put on makeup. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just gonna take a moment. Well, I appreciate you sharing this, um, you know, today in particular, obviously it's the anniversary, but there's people, people in Hong Kong who uh, have for the previous 31 years have been able yeah. to have some sort of remembrance of it yeah. uh, today. Of course, the Hong Kong government is, uh, is, is cracking down yeah. at the behest of their Chinese overlords. <laughs> so yeah. I put I put together a little timeline that maybe we can quickly walk through in case we have any younger viewers who aren't that familiar. But first, I did want to ask you uh, if I've done my math right. You were about ten years old when the Tiananmen Square demonstrations and sub sub uh, subsequent massacre happened. Were you aware of it at that time, or how did you become aware of it later? I, I wasn't aware of it at all, and it's embarrassing because some people my age, you know, were very familiar with it and remember seeing the uh, footage uh, on TV of a uh, gentleman in, in front of the tanks so the photos released and um, I'm disappointed because I, I, I didn't have any remembrance from uh, that was concurrent with it. I do remember though probably just a few years later seeing that image and being struck by uh, the power of it, um, the incredible courage that this seemingly ordinary man had, um, which uh, obviously he, he was 
much more extraordinary than uh, it appears to be. So, um, yeah, and just always kind of wondering, who is this guy? Uh, <laughs> who does this? You know, um, just a really mm -hmm. amazing person. And what specifically gave you the idea to make a film and, and this film in particular? Yeah, I had, uh, you know, just always wondered about this guy's backstory. And, um, you know, as I mentioned before, Patrick with Taliesin and Nexus, he had uh, asked me, hey, you know, I'd really appreciate it. We're always looking for good projects. Can you submit an idea? Oh. And we'll, we'll put it through our committee. And, and I said, you know, I've got one that I've just kind of think about. Um, and had a, a you know kind of a rough idea, nothing nothing specific at that point, but I knew I wanted to portray the life of an ordinary person who went and did something extraordinary. Mm -hmm. That's what I see when I see yeah. that. Yeah. Know, he's clearly not the biggest guy, the strongest guy. He doesn't have a bazooka and a machete yeah. slung over his shoulders. You know, he's a, a guy yeah. with shopping bags and uh, yeah. and. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, pair of trousers and, uh, and and that's about it. And, um, and I I've always loved my heroes um, in that vein. You know, it's, Hercules is cool, but Hercules is this really big, powerful, strong guy. You know, endowed by the gods with with these amazing qualities. Um, Frodo Baggins. That guy's amazing. He's, you know, one of the shortest, you know, uh, creatures on the planet, you know, uh -huh. <laughs> not particularly strong. Um, yeah. Not even particularly wise, uh, you know, not, uh, he doesn't even have like the shrewdness of Odysseus. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, he's just kind of an ordinary yeah. thing. And, uh, but he realizes there's a big problem out there mm -hmm. and something needs to be done and somebody needs to step forward and do it. And I guess it may as well be me. Uh, and so mm -hmm. he did. Uh, so, you know, those, those are the kinds of stories. And maybe it's because I'm not the biggest guy or the strongest guy or the smartest guy, you know? And so I'm like, I want my heroes to be like that as well. And regular. <laughs> Yeah, regular fella. Uh, and so, you know. And I know you've screened Tank Man at a lot of film festivals over the last couple of years. Uh, obviously, the, the first place that would have accepted it was, of course, the Beijing Film Festival, correct? Do I have my, my information right? <laughs> yeah. What was your um, experience screening this in Beijing, Robert? <laughs> yeah, so I... I I submitted this film to a lot of festivals. So, um, I submitted to lots of festivals, but in particular to every uh, Chinese, um, uh, and I'll say that culturally, so to China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, um, I submitted to every film festival in those countries, as well as every Asian American film festival in the US. Um, I uh, did did not get accepted into the Beijing International Film Festival. I was not too surprised about that. Um, I, I could just imagine if it even got to the point where somebody was screening it and watching it, like what could their reaction have been? Um, I would have been uh, priceless. I would have been killed for watching, you know, two minutes of it. Yeah. But, um, but at least they sent your money back, right? No, no, definitely did not get a refund on that. <laughs> <laughs> what what really struck me as odd, though, was that um, of all of the Asian American film festivals, I had only been accepted into one. Oh, wow. And that was in Texas. And it figures, you know, maybe that it was in Texas. because Texas kind of marches to their own beat. Um, but it was very disappointing. And I that this is not a perfect film. This is not, uh, you know, this is not the greatest film or the greatest short film. But it features the, um, you know, an Asian story, and it had an all Asian cast. And 
I don't think there's a big enough volume of that uh, that's being submitted to have excluded this from so many film festivals. Yeah. I was troubled by it, but you know, I, I said, okay, well, maybe it was just not, you know, of, uh, of a good understand that. You know, there are a lot of flaws, all mine. Um, but then there was another film that was made called Empty Skies. That, uh, was made in the same time period with the same organization. And theirs was uh, an excellent film. Um, truly professional couple who made that film. And it had made the shortlist for the Academy Award student film nomination. So basically oh. like in the top 10. So like, you know, it's, it's a film. quality film. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is, uh, you know, yeah, being judged as, as a very top notch, uh, doubt about it. They didn't make it into any Asian American film festivals at all. And wow. That to me is really distressing. Um, I just, I'm going to wrap up one other problem that potential problem for my film could be that I am clearly not Asian, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, uh -huh. I'm a white guy. I mean, I, 23 and me says I have like a 1% Asian, uh, in, it could be a, a rounding error, but regardless, like nobody's going to mistake me for being a Chinese man making this film. Um, but they at least had the authenticity of that. The girl, uh, the woman filmmaker was from China, uh, you know, telling a Chinese story. Um, so, you know, even if you're trying to kind of exclude these projects on the authenticity basis or, you know, people stealing stories, cultural appropriation, like people, mm -hmm. talk about, uh, you know, that, that was something you, you could not uh, have with that one. Like there, there was just no yeah. excuse for theirs. Yeah, yeah. One of the challenges with casting was, um, as I, I wanted to have an all Chinese cast because I knew that would be obviously an important, um, important aspect to it. Uh, you know, to have to give it that authenticity. But uh, as people learned more about my film, I had a number of uh, actors say, you know, I, I can't do this. I can't continue in this process, and uh, and they would go on to give one of a few different reasons. One was I'm Chinese. And I want to go back to China and I don't, I cannot, uh, you know, do this because of the problems it can create. I mean, they can be put into prison over something like this. Um, they said, or they said, you know, I have family in China and they could be harassed uh, uh, based on their participation or even just that they'd like to visit. And they're concerned that this could could prevent even a travel visa or, or some ability of theirs to travel to China. Um, and these are very real concerns. And this is something I, I would like to mention in the context of, you know, in America, we have valid concerns about our freedoms. I mean, everywhere there's valid, you know, where there's government, there's a threat to freedom. So, you know, we, we all have these concerns, but it's not with the regularity and the dependency and the expectation of it, that in China, this is just understood. You know, you cannot ridicule the government. You cannot talk about certain aspects of history. You will receive penalties or you are extremely likely to be penalized, you and possibly your family for those kinds of activities. We simply don't face in the same way here. Not to say, uh, obviously, we need to maintain our vigilance and preserve that. And I'm sure there are many who would yeah. like to, um, you know, threaten those kinds of, of liberties. But it's something that at least for now we get to, to enjoy. And, and so it's making yeah, we can protect it while still appreciating it. Yes, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, you know, you know, hopefully we'll talk a bit more about the hearing notification, but that's part of the importance yeah. of informed juries who are yeah. there to protect these rights so that yeah. we go down these paths. Well, that provides a good segue <laughs> to kind of a transition from the film and your experience showing it kind of into how it is so timely today in particular. Um, I, I know I was a little sarcastic there about the Beijing Film Festival, but you actually did screen it in Hong Kong at a film festival. That's and true. that was 
at a very uh, interesting time in, in Hong Kong history. I wonder if you would tell us um, about that experience, going to Hong Kong, what was going on there at the time, uh, what was uh, not, not just about the screening itself, but what was the atmosphere in society two years ago, um, and uh, kind of help place it in the timeline of events, if you could. Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was very exciting. Um, and I really appreciated how vibrant um, the culture was at, at that time. I mean, it, uh, you know, the, the protests had begun again. Um, you know, they've, they've had various protests over the years. I mean, even, well, of course, even when we go back to the British rule, um, there were protests against British rule and understandably so. Um, uh, but in recent times, it's been protests against uh, encroaching uh, Chinese government domination and um, and uh, the Chinese government replacing rules uh, of and getting rid of liberties that Hong Kongers have expected and relied on and enjoyed. Um, and uh, you, you have people now in Hong Kong hearkening back saying, boy, I wish the British were back. Uh, because they enjoyed a certain set of institutions um, that they truly come to love uh, that, that are not shared uh, with the Chinese government. Um, when I went there, the protests, this was in the summer of 2019, and the protests really started to heat up. And in fact, I had uh, some- Quick, some, quick uh, if I can interrupt, when in the summer? Was this like May, June, July? Uh, this was actually in July. Uh, okay. Uh, and there were uh, folks from a free market institute um, called Lion Rock Institute who uh, cautioned me saying, you know, it might be better if you don't come um, for various reasons, you know, some of, some of which was, you know, the, the material that you're going to be screening and just also the general kind of some chaos of the time. Of course, I kind of throw caution the wind at times. And so uh, went and, and screened and it was... Um, I didn't really experience any problems, but I was able to participate um, in uh, in a protest uh, while I was there, which which I was happy to, to do. And uh, the Hong Kongers who, who you know I'm sure with were grateful, and, and uh, they were appreciative that I even knew what was going on over there. <laughs> uh, you, I'm very interested in what's happening. Yeah. Do um, you did you visit the June Fourth Museum while you were there? Can you tell so us a little I, bit about I, that? I visited the June 4th Museum on July 4th because wow. I had no better way to celebrate Independence Day, um, uh, you know, our American appreciation for freedom by, um, you know, uh, honoring the tragic events of June 4th uh, and their efforts, the students and, and other people's efforts towards greater freedom in China that was all too brutally crushed. Um, I had met at the time the uh, gentleman who um, ran that, uh, and he's a democracy activist in um, in uh, Hong Kong and in China. He and other colleagues would go up to China and basically teach people about democracy. And I think the, the way in which he had described it was, listen, if we are going to become a part of China you know, which is not supposed to happen in the short term. It's happened, it's supposed to happen in 20 something years. Um, but but uh, Xi Jinping is, is ignoring that entirely. Uh, but he, he thought, well, you know, let's try to, you know, if, if, if we can't change that fact that will be turned over to China, then we need to put our efforts on changing China so it becomes a more amenable, clear place to live. Um, and this, this gentleman wasn't a libertarian, but he, um, he definitely had a lot of appreciations for, um, for freedom and, um, and, uh, and was opposed to tyrannical one party, uh, communist party rule. Um, unfortunately, in the uh, recent high profile trials that happened in April, he and uh, Jimmy Lai were some of the gentlemen who received some of the longest sentences. He got 18 months um, in prison for basically, you know, dissent from the regime. I forget what the charges were, but, you know, it's all these kinds of mm -hmm. up, um, you know, uh, charges that 
those of us in a free society wouldn't have, um, would, shouldn't be experiencing, and it's something they're not used to seeing in Hong Kong. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the um, situation? Like they were protesting in the summer of 2019. What for? What was what was the big protest over? So there's been a number of protests over the years. Uh, one of which is uh, about uh, voting and your ability to uh, pick the candidates that you want without China having a say so um, in who's allowed to run. Um, who you can vote for, uh, but but one of the bigger sparks was a um, was a situation in which um, uh, Taiwan basically wanted to extradite somebody from Hong Kong to face murder charges, and there was not an extradition treaty um, that Hong Kong has with other places. And Taiwan is also independent. So, so yes, I, the, well, it depends on who you ask. <laughs> Don't ask John Cena. Um, uh, so Taiwan is uh, more formally formally known as the Republic of China, uh, as opposed to what we what, what we know as China, which is the People's Republic. Of China. And that's mainland China. Yeah, essentially the nationalist. It was the nationalists versus the communists in the 40s um, struggling for control over China. I'd argue neither side was, was great. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the communists weren't great, but the nationalists weren't really that swell. Uh, but they went to Taiwan, which is a little island off the coast of China. So from a U.S. perspective, they're independent from uh, yeah, Chinese from China's perspective, they're just part of China. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's another province. Um, okay. <laughs> and so, you know, many companies have been cowed into uh, you know, retracting all sorts of state mm -hmm. and images that have Taiwan as a distinct mm -hmm. non-China entity. Yeah. Most recent uh, news heavy example was uh, the former wrestler turned actor John Cena who had said something about, well, you know, the country that first got to see the F9, the, the ninth in the Fast and Furious franchise is Taiwan. Something to that effect, he yeah. made it clear that Taiwan was independent of China. Mm -hmm. um, and then basically there was such pressure, I'm sure, from the Chinese mm -hmm. government on the studio that he went online, you know, you've got this big hulking guy, you know, somebody who, who could be that hero about earlier you know it could be that hercules yeah. that you think he could do whatever yeah. he wants, but anything <laughs> the same i am yeah. so so very sorry uh, uh i am i've been any I, I never intended to insult the chinese people by yeah. the i want is independent i i couldn't be sorry i mean this this adult massively strong incredibly wealthy man uh who has so much at his disposal but is terrified of, of insulting the Chinese. Yeah. There's a tremendous amount at stake. And, yeah. and I, I understand, you know, and then the residuals of films and the profits that affects a lot mm -hmm. of people. But at some point, I think you also <laughs> have to say uh, we are not going to grovel. Yeah. Well, we only have about 15 minutes left. So I'm going to circle us back in a jury related direction. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the protest that was going on in 2019, I think uh, I kind of steered you off track, but it had to do with the extradition treaty. And it it was not just going to be with Taiwan. The, the, the protest that was going on while you were there was not just over extradition to Taiwan, which people were more or less OK with but that the Chinese government said, yes, extradition would be great. Yeah, Hong Kong, the people in Hong Kong were like, okay, we don't mind getting extradited to Taiwan, but we do not want to get extradited to China. Yeah, and, uh, and, and, and that traces back to their, they had a common law jury system when they were under British rule that came from the same source as our common law jury system here. And that, what gave China a way to circumvent that. Can you talk a little bit about why <coughs> jury nullification, China might want to <laughs> circumvent trial by jury? 
<laughs> Certainly. I, I mean, and this is one of the wonderful parts of our Anglo-American uh, heritage. You know, and, and it's I actually had a Chinese customer in, you know, in the shop the other day and I uh, was, was talking with her and, and we were, uh, you know, of course, cultures have, you know, different qualities, some that are great and, and some that are, aren't, that are, are not as great, you know, and, and one of which I was like, well, you know, I'm sure this is when she was, it disappoints me, like American culture, our respect for elders is, is nowhere near as strong as in China. And obviously with all things, there's limits, but I mean, certainly we could use a little more appreciation for that, I think, in, in the U.S. Uh, but certain things like uh, trial by jury, our legal system, um, uh, I think if you, if you appreciate and value liberty, then um, our common law tradition jury system uh, is, is one of the greatest protectors of that. And uh, it would be terrifying for an authoritarian regime like the Chinese Communist Party has um, uh, in China to, to have to face up to, you know, a, a piddling mass of, of citizens who would be able to uh, go against their dictates, you know, who would be able to overturn a sentence or, or, or what their expected uh, sentence would be or to nullify a law. Um, you know, that's not something that, that, listen, you don't have authoritarian regimes, so it can just get flipped over by a few regular old people, you know, yeah. like yeah. that, that's not something that could be appreciated. And it's one of yeah. the uh, beauties of the U S system. Mm -hmm. You have the potential for that. So long as jurors understand that that is in their power mm -hmm. is essentially a, a final civilized check government mm -hmm. because after that like the recourse is you know well you, you go to the guns and, and nobody wants nobody should want that to happen you yeah. know yeah. so we it's an important check on government power you know that yeah. government uh, can create the laws and some may be uh, well-intentioned some may even be good ideas you know like most of us, we're not trying to, I don't know anybody who's trying to overturn the law on murder, but you know, there are a lot of laws that, that shouldn't be there, shouldn't be in the books. And, yeah. yeah, and, uh, and I'll even say, especially in China, um, the in 2019, that extradition law didn't get passed, but fast forward to 2020, and at the end of June, that it got folded in with a national security law that provided drastic punishments for it and it was vaguely written so that basically anytime the government didn't like you they could decide you had committed a crime and not just threats but arrests began for things by having a flag having a sticker having a political banner anything else indicating even the mildest preference for independence was deemed a threat to national security. And I even saw an article where, and I don't know if they were arrested or just threatened, but people were holding up blank pieces of white pieces of paper. And that was considered subversive enough <laughs> that they, that that should be criminalized. Yeah. So well, you have yeah. people who are holding candles uh, these past few days and they're yeah. getting arrested for that. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about what's been happening in the last couple of weeks. I'll just give for anyone who's not following Fiji an update. Um, but on May 13th, uh, the first person charged under that national security law was told, nope, you can't have a jury trial. And recall that in 1997, when Hong Kong was turned back over to Chinese control, there was an agreement made that for 50 years, uh, Hong Kong would have essentially no change. It was called one country, two systems, and Hong Kong was to retain its ability to govern itself, to provide for its own legal and economic affairs, have its own trade treaties and all that. Um, but as of just a couple of weeks ago on May 20th, the Hong Kong Department of Justice uh, uh, posted on their website a summary of an appeal in that case with a ruling that effectively ended trial by jury. Um, 
it was in the case of Tong Young Kit versus Secretary for Justice, and the summary states that, quote, the court in deciding whether to grant the application for transfer, i.e. to a jury, is concerned only with what the interest of justice would require, but an accused can have a fair trial with or without a jury. It further states that, quote, there was nothing inherently unreasonable in directing a trial by a panel of three judges sitting without a jury when there was a perceived risk of the personal safety of jurors and their family members and that or that due administration of justice might be impaired. In other words, if there's any chance you're not convicted, we can just skip the jury part because that would be very inconvenient. And then just uh, looking at the news uh, last night, uh, where each year on June 4th, since Tiananmen Square, there has been a vigil held at Victoria Park in Hong Kong. And it was uh, it was supposedly canceled last year, but I believe people were able to get in. So this year, 200 police officers surrounded and barricaded the park. And these commemorations were banned, notably not only this time, but also back in 2003 uh, when there were, there were mass protests, supposedly because of the pandemic. Keep that in mind, everyone. Um, and people were uh, outside of the park uh, dressed in black holding can electric candles and were getting arrested. The June 4th museum has been shut down again. Everyone think of the parallels here because supposedly it doesn't have a proper license. Yes, yeah, and that's another uh, Yeah. bit we, you know, it, it's, it can be an easy tendency for people to think that, well, you know, these licenses are important, you know, important that we have these kinds of regulations to ensure that, uh, you know, everything is done properly and things are, are safe and et cetera. And of course, these are all, you know, important factors, but, you know, what ends up happening is that these licenses then are used to, to pummel people with. And of course, you know, we see that in the U.S. with business licenses and how uh, it's protected a lot of people in certain industries or certain professions. Um, and, and it's often used as a club against uh, minorities or um, other, other groups who may be less enfranchised. Uh, uh, and, and this is just another case of that, you know, and this is yeah. a very typical move for an authoritarian government to do, to um, use an argument like a license to shut down the June 4th Museum, particularly right around this holiday. I'm was, sure it was a total coincidence. Yeah, I, I, I will, would also mention that this is similar to um, the 30th anniversary when I was back in Hong Kong. Um, you know, China has their own kind of version of Facebook, their own social media that the government controls called WeChat. And they're constantly censoring things and, and blocking users and taking things off. And you can't even write 64, number 64, because that's a, a June 4th symbol. And so they, they won't allow that. But they shut it down the days surrounding the June 4th uh, 20th anniversary. They, they shut we, the WeChat down during that time to, uh, to ostensibly do an upgrade. Um, but it, it seemed also clear that that upgrade was convenient yeah. at the same time as um, yeah. you know, as when they, uh, when people might be sharing messages yeah. of anniversary. We've got a question from Barry. <laughs> Hi, Barry. <laughs> that name may sound familiar to you, Robert. Yeah, Barry. I, I miss Barry. Barry says, hi, Robert. Great to hear more about your fantastic project. I wish I, I, wish I could uh, convey his emotions better. And your efforts to promote greater awareness of the events of June 4th, 1989. Have you shared this? This was a little earlier, so we'll have to speculate a little about what this was. But have you shared this with the US State Department and any political figures? And what, if any, was their response? You know, I, unfortunately, I that's not an area that I have strong connections with. So, uh, um, but no, but certainly, you know, I, I welcome anybody who's out there who has uh, any connections that that you know, if you feel that uh, people might benefit from seeing this or would have a greater audience to share this with, or um, you know, just uh, something, anything that can help raise awareness about this. Incident and uh, and also of course what is currently going on 
in China uh, because you know it's it's one thing to talk about what happened 30 years ago, but there's you know, a ton of tragedies happening right now. Um, of course, you know, what we see with Hong Kong, but also what we see in, in uh, going on in Western China, where um, many reports seem to say it's basically a genocide of the Uyghur population there. Um, and, and there have there have been some particularly disturbing passages uh, um, reports that they are literally trying to um, breed out the population by sending people named Han Chinese to live in weaker homes with women whose husbands are in prison in these work camps. Um, and uh, I mean, just, talk about rape culture. Yeah, this is happening in our lifetime with people who have a seat uh, at all the important tables in the world. Well, let's take the last three minutes here and answer the big question of the day, which is what can jurors learn from Tank Man? I have a few thoughts on that, but I would love to hear yours first, Robert. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to create, keep this brief because I'd love to hear yours. I, I think probably the most important um, aspect would be that uh, kind of what we alerted to alluded to earlier, which is that you know you do not to, to a hero takes many forms, and so you know we we often think we've got to be big and strong and loud and mighty, um, be an excellent marksman or swordsman or what what have you. Um, this this gentleman, I, I don't believe he was any of those things. I don't think he was loud. I don't think he was tall. He wasn't muscular. Probably not particularly uh, handsome or intelligent or anything else. He was just somebody who uh, could not stand by any longer and see injustice done. And he wanted to do his part, however small that might be, to help stem the tide of evil in the world and do the good and the gracious and the beautiful. And I think that jurors, this is something that the jurors have the absolute power to do that. I'm not convicting someone uh, when that would create a greater injustice. The, the other thing I'll mention that really stands out for me is the power of one. I mean, here you have Tiananmen Square with thousands upon thousands of people and what is the image we remember? It's just one guy. And it, to me, the parallels with, with jurors' awesome ability is, is just huge there. You don't have to have anyone else agree with you when you're on a jury. It was nice that he had all those people behind him, but they weren't standing next to him. <laughs> he didn't need them to stand next to him. He was able to stop not just one, but a huge line of tanks um, the image on your shirt shows one, but uh, you've showed me the, the zoomed out view before. And there is a long line of tanks and just this one guy by himself is able to stop that. And I think about the parallel to jurors is that one person voting not guilty, you can make sure someone is not convicted that day just by yourself. You don't need to have people agree with you. It's convenient, it's nice. <laughs> certainly psychologically fortifying, but it's not necessary. And uh, the other thing you pointed out uh, that stood out to me was, this wasn't a guy with a, a rifle or a hand grenade. This is a guy with shopping bags. Jurors, you know what? You don't need to, to be a legal scholar. You don't need to come in with any sort of weapons. I doubt you probably would be able to. <laughs> you just need two words not guilty. So th those really um, kind of were the inspiration I got from, from the film and the individual uh, that stood out to me as regards jury service. So I want to thank you so much, Robert, for making this wonderful film, as well as for all of your uh, volunteer efforts on behalf of the Fully Informed Jury Association. Thank you. And I'm going to, I'm going to put up a, a I'm going to give you the last word, but I'm going to I'm going to share my screen and put up a uh, slide here so that people can learn more. All right, and uh, I will let you uh, make some concluding remarks here, Robert. 
So really just wanted to, to say, visit, uh, visit the website, tankmanthemovie.com or tankmanfilm.com. And please visit fija.org and contribute to fija.org and, and help Kirsten and, and all the people working with her keep on doing this amazing work to uh, support jury nullification. Just to remind folks that they, they're capable of doing so much, you know, they're more than we realize. Uh, and, and so go out there and be loving and be brave and, and, uh, and do right. I think I've got a, a link to our upcoming ma uh, uh, event, um, our Magna Carta Day uh, event on June 15th with uh, Michael Humer. And I also definitely want to stress that if you would like to see more programs like this, we would love your support. There is a link for you to uh, give on the Fiji website. Or if you are on Facebook, we have a fundraiser going right now. Um, we accept no government funding and we did not participate in any of the COVID related relief programs. So we are extra grateful for any uh, support you might wanna provide. Your generous support will continue to create more fully informed jurors. So uh, looking forward to seeing you in the future for Justice Before the Law with Mike, Michael Humer in celebration of Magna Carta Day. Barry, I hope we'll have you back then. <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, and upcoming, I, I haven't quite nailed it down, but in July, we will have Professor James Banal talking about his book, 20 Million Angry Men, The Case for Including Convicted Felons in Our Jury System. And with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Once again, thank you so much for your time, Robert, and all of your wonderful support. Thank you to everyone who participated. I'm going to try and uh, see if I can get permission to include the um, original copy of the film in the uh, version I'm going to edit and post. So if anyone had any trouble, um, you will either be able to see it in full in smooth uh, view there or we will provide a link to where you can view it online but uh, thank you so much robert for joining us and thank you all for being here <laughs>